This week's episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show is sponsored by North Broad Street Records, bringing you the very best in unissued music. North Broad Street Records discovers and brings to vinyl cool, unfinished gems. For more information, please visit www.northbroadst.co.uk. Coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. He's the only player Josh Dean ever signed twice. The Secret Service are screaming at him, saying, Do you deny you're a bomb maker for Al Qaeda? And he says, no, oh, I admit everything, I did it and I'd like to help you. I basically went detective, uh, caught the guy, tricked him into giving me his phone number, phoned the police and I was like, look, here's this, the script, You're like, you need to do something about this. Welcome along to Salt and Sauce Show, I'm David Simmons, it's season two, episode two. On the show this week, I have got fellow podcaster and presenter of the Blethered podcast, we've got Sean McDonald on the show. Sean, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, mate. What a setup, by the way. Unbelievable. He's at the studios, eh? Aye, aye. So it's a bit weird, it's like an interview with an interviewer, if that makes sense. So I know. It should be good, mate. We'll go with it. Tell us a bit about yourself, Sean. How, who's, who is Sean McDonald? Hi, um, Sean McDonald. I'm from Glasgow. Uh, I run the Blethered podcast, which has been going for two years now. Um... I did have a life previous to that, which if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to elaborate upon. But um, aye, no, it's um, good to be here. It's funny to be on the other side of the table. I always find it a bit strange. A bit intimidating. <laughs> aye, a wee bit. So what made you want to do a podcast? What inspired you to start doing a podcast, mate? Um, so I, I have always said that podcast is the media that I consume most. I don't know if it's because I'm always on the move or just, I don't know, I really enjoy them. But I never thought about actually doing one until I, pal, I always give him a mention, Justin Tate. Turned around and said, you should do a podcast. And I was like, shut up, mate. I think a month went past, and it, but he planted the seed. Um, and I thought, aye, I would like to do that. Purely just for my own enjoyment. Um, you know that way you listen to something, you think, oh, I would have asked such and such, yep. or I would have kind of taken it here. Uh, but I thought I would just enjoy the process. So I ordered a mic off Amazon, and it just kind of snowballed. The rest is today. Brilliant. Because you've got like over 60 podcasts in the bank now, and you've recently moved with in with Big Light Media, is that right? Aye, so the Big Light is owned by Janice Forsyth, who's BBC broadcaster and producer legend uh, Fiona White. Um, they they started that up, I think that was kind of, this must have been late 2018, uh, and the concept was to create a network of Scottish voices, Scottish podcasts. Um, aye, so that... I can't think I was going for about eight or nine months before it was actually announced because everything was being done in the background and then they had the launch and that just continues to grow as well. So that's good to be part of. Brilliant. Especially having they two above you, if you like, as sort of mentors. Did they, did they give you much feedback and uh, show you what path they go down or are they just basically there? <laughs> I, it's a mix of both um, because Blethered is part of the network, but it's, I mean, I write, record, produce, research, edit, decide, you know, everything is, is I've got the final word. They would never try and interfere. Um, no, that's good, you left I, your own devices I left them on devices, but they're, they're great because, I mean, between them, the experience they've got The people they know, the contacts, the things they've done So if they speak, I'll always listen um, But it's good, it's a good balance of being supportive But also, and kind of steering me in the right direction at times But also just kind of letting me go and do my thing There isn't much restriction, which you get with Where other networks can I say this, can I do that you know, I Don't touch this, they kind of just say, say it Swear as much as you want, do what you want, it's I like it. Guess I wouldn't have been part of it otherwise, you know. Yeah, brilliant. That's superb, mate. Um, you've been announced as being in the top twenty-three podcast to listen to right now. Who was it that said that? Was it the Guardian, the <coughs> Daily Mail? Was it? Uh, it was Radio Times. Radio Times. Uh, aye. So I got an email just out of the blue saying, "Can you send us artwork? Because we're going to feature you in this this thing, which was a great accolade." Because um, I wouldn't bang my own drum too much, but when you look at who's on the list, it's March of the Day. And Dolly Parton is on there, <laughs> but the rest is like the BBC, uh, LA Times, New York Times, Professor Brian Cox. So it's the only, only independent show that was on there. So um, that was a bribe well spent. Nah, I'm like, isn't it? <laughs> That's a great accolade, though, mate. To be like, say, sixty shows in, and you're in the top twenty three to watch. I I think I might be eighty shows. Sure, seventy nine, seventy nine, eighty. I think I, I lose track. I it's, it's it's brilliant. I think especially because it's funded by me. Um, I don't have a, a researcher or a producer. It'd be nice to have somebody put notes in front of me and say, here's everything you need to know. Yep. But I think that's part of the fun of it. Um, I, it's literally just me asking questions that I'm interested in, um, speaking to people that I'm interested in. I don't know, maybe that that comes across. Because I always say like people buy into authenticity. So if you look at some of the people that have been on reality TV, um, I don't want to pick anybody in particular, but just think how 
horrendously some people can act, yet they somehow build up a big fan base. And I'm not saying that I act horrendously or atrociously, <laughs> but people always say, I, I like him because he's real. I mean, look at Donald Trump just now. Yep. You get people who say, I like him because he's real. You know, he, he tells me he's going to eat me and he hates me, but, you know, he's being honest, so I like him. And I think, I don't know, maybe people just buy into that authenticity, just kind of being very much myself. Yeah. As someone that uh, you interviewed as part of your podcast, as someone quite close to home, you interviewed your own granddad. Aye, I did, aye. Um, that was a good one. We've, we've, uh, we're very close, so it was great to be able to do that. Even to, not to get too morbid, but to always have something to, exactly, to yeah. be able to listen back to and document. And it's just the, the conversation that we had is just the laughs that we have with each other all the time anyway, so it was nice to be able to do it. No, I get that. I mean, I've, I've both my granddads have sadly passed. Now, to have that would be superb because some of the stories they tell you are, are different class, aren't they? I know, and I do forget some as well because he's, he's a good laugh. And I think you forget that family members that you've got, especially if they're older than you, you forget they were once your age and yep. younger and they get up to the same scrapes, if not worse, because there's a lot of things that I couldn't <laughs> have put in there because yeah. we would have both got in trouble. Um, but it was amazing to be able to do, especially with being being so close. He was funny at the start, he was all nervous and like careful of what he was saying. Eventually I just managed to get him to relax and then the stories just start spilling it. Brilliant. Um sticking with your family, you you're related to a bit of a Celtic legend, aren't you? I uh, Tommy Callahan. So he was on I was doing uh, interviews of prominent Celtic fans or, or Celtic figures uh, for the twenty minute Tims. Am I allowed to mention them on here? We play ah, for the go TMT, for good lads. <laughs> uh I and to, to be able to sit down with Tommy and and my uncle, his son. And just ask, because again, these are all stories that I already knew. Ones like him getting absolutely steaming on pre-season and Tommy Gemmo, and I think it was Bobby Lennox having to sneak him past Jock Steen so he didn't notice things like Tommy Gemmo making him late for training and games and Jock putting him off the bus. Um, but amazing. There's a good fact about Jock Steen related to him, isn't there? There is. He is, he loves to tell you this, he's the only player Jock Steen ever signed twice because Jock signed him for Dunfermline. Then Jocks went to, was it 65 that Jock went to Celtic? And then he signed him in 68 uh, to bring him in as well, and he was there for a number of years. That's and, uh, a good fact to have a good isn't it? He, he'll want me to say as well, he says he invented the double shuffle, <laughs> says the double step over, so who am I to tell him he's lying? <laughs> so Ronaldo's got his tips for way back to then. Aye, absolutely, came <laughs> for Tommy. So from your granddad to Tommy Callahan, you've interviewed some vast amount of people. Mm -hmm. um, one of them that really stood out to me and I had a listen to was ex-Al-Qaeda bomb maker, MI5 spy, Eamon Dean. What How did that come about? What a title that is. That came about because, so there's a guy called Jake Warren, and he owns a company called Message Heard, uh, and they're a production company, they make podcasts, uh, and they do some amazing ones. So there's one called Conflicted, and it features a guy, Thomas Small, who, he, he, he went to, the, I think, the Greek mountains, and he studied to become a monk. Uh, he's, he's very ingrained in Middle Eastern Arab culture He speaks Arabic and he knows his stuff And Thomas and Eamon Dean Who was an ex-Al-Qaeda bomb maker Swore an oath of allegiance to Osama bin Laden He uh, then started to become disillusioned With what Al-Qaeda were actually doing He was sold a very different dream he was, It says he was brainwashed as you can hear in the interview uh, So he defected, he went to Qatar and he essentially handed himself in. And he was about to be in prison for life. And he's sitting down at the interrogation table and the Secret Service are screaming at him. And they're saying, do you deny that you're a bomb maker for Al-Qaeda? And he says, no, I admit everything. I did it and I'd like to help you. So then he said, all right, okay, that was easy. <laughs> so they slid him three, I think a day later, three envelopes. That's MI6. Oh, that's the British Security Services. That's the CIA. And that's the French. Who do you want to join? So he says, well, I don't speak French, I speak English, so uh, that leaves the CIA and, and the British services. And he says, well, you know, about two months ago I was firing mortars and rockets at the Americans, so I think I should probably join, join the British. So he joined MI6 and he was undercover for about six or seven years. Unbelievable story. So this guy, Jake Warren, he worked for Vice. Uh, and he was making documentaries in North Korea, Iraq. And he did one with EDL and Tommy Robinson. He did ones with ISIS. And uh, he came to meet Eamon Dean. So they created this show where these two guys sit across from each other. And they basically, they go for way back. They, they go back, like way, way back. And they, they discuss how uh, the Middle East came to be what it is in terms of politically, social, politically, economically, uh, in terms of military conflicts and stuff. And I thought this show was amazing. 
So I just tweeted about it, saying I loved it, and then other people picked up on it. So the guy Jake got in touch, said thanks very much. We've noticed a big spike in Scotland, like since you mentioned it, because it was it wasn't a little known, but it was only kind of just starting. So I interviewed him. It went really well, and then I get a message saying, "Would you like to interview Eamon? So I was like, "Well, this is what I was hoping would happen in, in a sense." And uh, I, I came came into the studio, and for somebody who was. And in, in obviously one of the most horrendous terror organisations I've ever been. Uh-huh. He's the loveliest guy you'll ever meet. He's just a really nice, lovely wee guy, and um, that that's what I was most interested. Is that maybe in. why he's going down that path now, of trying to like help against that organisation because he's just a genuinely nice guy? Or um, is there other motives behind it? I mean, I think it would be naive to not to realise that he's also what. He, I want to say carve out a media career because I, I assume he's very comfortable because he advises banks, um, credit card companies, oil companies, governments around the world. Uh, he's freelance, so he's all right money wise, but he's uh, he's doing media work, so it all helps. He's got a book, right, um, which is out called um, Nine Lives: My Life as a the West's Top Spy and Al Qaeda or something like that. mental. And the, I mean, it's a two hour interview. Um, but the feedback I've had is that people say like it flies in because they're just hearing these stories and dissecting it. But I wanted to understand. I was like, why? Why did such a because he's he memorized the Quran back to front, a mm-hmm. uh, front to back when he was like eleven. He's he's obscenely intelligent. Yeah, and he's obviously got then good critical thinking skills, or he's able to an- analyze. And I just wanted to understand. I was like, why? Why would you? Because he he realized very quickly. And we get to the root of that in the interview, how how he was uh, brainwashed. And I concluded that if it was me who was put in his place and lived his experience, I would have probably went down the, the same route. Same path, yeah. So how do you prepare for an interview like that? Because I listened to it and you do, you rattle off phrases in the Quran, mate, so Aye. you must have done a, a fair bit of research. Aye, I, was, I was able to tell him the name of the maid or the nanny that brought him up, <laughs> uh, the, the, the uni courses that his, his family did. And I think it being detailed... Uh, and and just doing just doing your research, but I think if you if you're really interested, you will find this information out anyway, and then that comes across in the interview. Um, but I just wanted to make sure. I think also I knew what I wanted to achieve, which was to find out first of all, obviously the chronological story, but to get into the nuances, like why did you do that? Like what inspired that? Why did you then realise what made you change your mind? Um, so I just made sure I knew everything there was to know about. Him. I read his book. Um, I watched every interview he'd ever done. Um, I read everything that's ever been printed about him. I think I was back at page 50 in Google. I normally <laughs> only go to page two or three <laughs> because I thought, I want to know what information's out there and it will help me identify what has been missed or what questions haven't been asked. Or, and that kind of helped me devise, you know, how I was going to do it. But it was, it was good fun, like, because he's... The book is absolutely mental. I, I would recommend it to anybody. Really? It's it's some story. Um, it just kind of made it easy for them. Yeah, I mean, you, the guests that you've had on your show, they're, I mean, they're really diverse. I mean, you've had uh, Edith Bowman, Scottish ex-Radio 1 MTV presenter, uh, from an Al-Qaeda bomber to, I, I to her. I mean, how was she? Oh, she was brand new. She was so nice. There's some people that you meet, I suppose, in the industry in general. 99.9% of people I've met have been great. You get the odd person who disappoints you. Um and I'm always kind of wary of that. I do go into things optimistic, expecting the best. And I, she, she provided that. She was lovely. Couldn't have been nicer. Uh, gave me what I was looking for. Provided maybe a, a few laughs as well. So I can't kind of speak highly enough of her. Um, we'll come back to some of your shows shortly. But I mean, you've got quite a, a big link to, to Spain, haven't you? You spent quite a, a bit of time over there, about six years. Is that right? Aye, aye. So I moved to Barcelona when I was 22, uh, back in 2013, and. Uh, I went to Barcelona and just refused to come back. Uh, to to be honest, about was about two years ago, I was working freelance for a and that I was working sorry remotely for a company, which meant I'd be able to work for anywhere, which I took advantage of. So I thought I'll come back to Glasgow for a bit. Uh, I intended to stay for a few months before I headed back off to the sunset, and uh, then the podcast started up. I didn't expect that to go the way that the way that it did, and it very quickly sort of offers coming in and things growing and make money off it where I was like right I'd be I'd be daft to go back but I think Barcelona will always be home um I'll return there at some point but then I don't like to stay just in the one place so I'm always kind of on the move but I've got all my pals are there I, I, I feel just as home just as at home there as I do 
Glasgow or anywhere else, to be honest. And you'll fit right in there because you do. You speak fluent Spanish, don't you? And you were saying off air another four languages as well. Is that I, right? I, I speak Spanish. Well, Spanish is my best. I speak Spanish to, I've been told, native level. I can't really say that. That sounds arsey, doesn't it, if I say that. But I speak, I, I speak Spanish um, as if I grew up there. Um, my Catalan and French and Italian, I, I, I'm still fluent in them. But no, I have to think a wee bit more than Spanish kind of just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Try and teach myself a few others. I've got a few bits of Japanese and Portuguese, but those are my those are my main ones. I can get by with those. You ever thought about doing a podcast in a, a different language? Or I do. I've you got do? Oh, yes. Gorgeous. I've got. Uh, I've, I do episodes in Spanish. So I interviewed uh, a pal of mine who's a bit of a nomad. So he's from Argentina, but he's lived in Ireland, Barcelona, South of Spain, Italy, and France. So I interviewed him about his life, like why he was uh, he was out and about, uh, living in all these different places. That was good. And uh, a couple of other ones where I answer like listeners' questions because I've been invited into a couple of schools to speak to like modern languages departments and stuff. So I was like compiling questions that people had and then just kind of answering them yeah. and a bit of monologue, just having a bit of a laugh. But I'd like to do more. I'd actually like to interview the uh, the Celtic women's coach. Oh, it's just terrible. I can't remember his name now. <laughs> but uh, he's he's Spanish. Right. I'm sure, he's Spanish. He's Spanish speaking anyway. So I'd love to speak to him as well. So I'm going to try and get Kerry Keenan to sort that out. So that's me calling her out if she uh, happens to be listening to this. <laughs> how uh, how do you say the salt and sauce show in Spanish? Sorry, uh, put in the spot. Is it a, a translation it. of it? I would, but it would be for sure. Espectacular de sal y salsa. Love there that. Absolutely love that. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, one thing I want to talk to you about, because you touched on this on one of your guests, um, catfishing. Yes. What is catfishing? Catfishing is the the act or practice of someone masquerading uh, as another person online in order to cultivate or develop a relationship which is often emotional or uh, romantic in nature. That's, that's what catfishing is. So basically catfishing, to simplify that, is when somebody makes a fake profile pretending to be somebody else, usually for some sort of sinister or nefarious... Um, and go. So you had somebody on, was it with the producer's MTV show Catfish or was it? I this was a weird one. So I mean I, I I've had it quite often and I don't know why. I genuinely don't know why. I think like it says quite a lot about these people's standards that they can choose for seven billion people and they're taking my pictures, it's bizarre. Um and it happens or it does happen often. And I don't often mention it, but there was one guy I need to watch what I say, because the irony of this is that I could end up being prosecuted. But there was somebody who was doing it that was that started in 2018, and he was contacting children, oh, which is where it starts getting really... Using hit. your pictures? I getting really dark. And he was contacting women as well, and basically he was conning them into sending naked photos. And uh, so my stress levels were through the roof, because it's one thing if a wee guy uses them, and you're like, well, that's quite unnerving, but... You know, worse things happen. Started getting really bad. I basically went detective, uh, caught the guy, tricked him into giving me his phone number, phoned the police, and I was like, "Look, here's this, the script. Like, you need to do something about this." Because I was getting distra- like a few distraught girls getting in touch saying, "I've sent yeah. naked photos." Basically, it, it really creeps me out to see it, and it kind of embarrasses me to be involved with it. But it is what it is. So I got in touch. The police were a, a, they were a shambles. I had to explain to them why this guy was breaking the law. They were saying, I don't know. And I was saying, well, it comes under the Misuse of Communications Act, I think, which was amended in 2004. I'd, you know, I'd done my research. Yeah. I haven't to do their work for them. Gave them the phone number and they said, we'll, we'll, we'll look into it. And I said, listen, you either go and deal with it or I'll go, about, I'll go over your head and I will be citing you as not wanting to do anything about it. So they, they went to their... Um, excuse me, their, I don't know if it was like digital research team or something, or communications team, and they were going to cross-reference the number th- with uh, mobile phone network providers to find out who the number belonged to. Yeah. But they didn't have to do that because they already had this guy's number on file anyway. If you phone the police to report something, they take your number. So they went to his door, kind of spoke to him, uh, and it kind of stopped. Well, I think it stopped. There's still other ones that happen. But to go back to the catfish thing, I was coming back for Italy a few weeks ago and I got a message from Alassie Amy that I know saying, just to let you know, this is here, I've reported it. I thought, that's really weird. 30 seconds later, sorry, what I thought was weird was about 30 seconds later, somebody at MTV sent me, well, Viacom, who's the people that, I think they own MTV, right. saying they're making this show, would I help them promote it just by tweeting about it and see if they could get people to apply and I said, well, that's really, really strange that you send that at this time because look, and I sent her a screenshot 
And I said, I'm actually going to be doing an episode on it to discuss it with a lassie who got duped with thinking it was, she was talking to me. Um, and then they were saying, well, what about we if we give you a producer or somebody who's working on this show and you can talk about it and you can sort of promote it yeah. by by means of doing that podcast. I so spoke to that guy and it was, it was interesting. He was very, he was standoffish. He didn't really give too much. I had to just use him as a conduit to drive the conversation so I could say what I wanted to say. Um, but it was interesting hearing how it's been done. So I MTV, I may as well give that a blog for them. MTV are recruiting people for um, to take part in catfish. So if you've been duped or done, get in touch with them. You might get a wee bit of money and get on the telly and get to meet a few famous people. What's the chances of them contacting you while you're going through something similar? That's crazy. I, I know, but I, even for it to be sent at the exact same time, yep. because you know the way an Instagram message comes in. So when I've clicked on it, and when I've come back out, that one for them was there, and I thought, that's really strange. So I kind of took it as a sign, and I was like, fuck it. We'll so I take it. it this is where people like this are getting your photos off Instagram, off Facebook, off social media. Is that where they're using uh, your photos to recycle them for? I basically, and I mean, I, I, I've had all sorts. I've had people saying, oh, you might be just, you must just be doing it yourself. Like, mate, better things really, to do I know, I've got better things to do with my time, for God's sake. I, don't, I only mention it if it gets, if it starts to get serious, because my concern was, you know, what Glasgow's like, or anywhere in Scotland, but imagine I'm on a night out and somebody goes, that's that guy who was messaging your daughter or your wife Aye. or something, so I kind of have to acknowledge it. I mean, I had somebody get in touch as well saying, uh, oh, I heard you're on Tinder. I'm, like, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't use it, I've never used it. Um, I mean, sorry to go back to, to the one that you said you had to take it in your own hands, you'd take matter in your own hands to, mm -hmm. to go and chase this guy. Was he prosecuted? Is it still ongoing? Or? No, so all they, all they did was just give him a wee rap in the knuckles. He, he must be sick, like, he must be... Ill because I've got his number on my phone. I tried to phone him. Just uh, ask him why. I just and to say you better like you better chuck it because it's I'm no other people's gatekeepers. So if somebody's doing something weird, it's like I'm I'm just I just I, I, I kind of want to distance myself it and be like like I don't want anything to do with this. But when it gets into criminality like that, because again it it makes me cringe to even talk about it. But I feel like if I properly call it out it would probably maybe hopefully stop it but that is essentially possessing and creating indecent images of children which carries a, a well I would like to say automatic custodial sentence but we often see that that isn't the case um, with the justice system but that's a, a whole other topic um, but no he, he totally got away with it and it was purely because the police I remember distinctly said ah because I mean if he did it through Snapchat, like, see a sheriff, he, he won't know what Snapchat is. And I was like, well, Tweedledum and Tweedledee, that's your responsibility to explain to the sheriff what that is in order to secure a conviction. Like, why am I having to do your job for you? Really? Like, I, I mean, I, I've, never, I've never studied criminal law or anything. The, you know, my only education is watching Suits. And even I know I could probably easily obtain a guilty verdict. By, by prosecuting this guy so why they can't recognise that I don't know but that one's kind of done but I would say if it, if it gets bad then t ten of these people doing it I will catch you I'll get you and I'll fuck you up brilliant superb I love that have you ever thought about maybe trying to get somebody on board from the police and interview them on their side of things and how, how they deal with that and why they should be dealing with it a bit more stricter or? I, I have thought of that and it's a difficult one because I understand that their hands are tied yep. there's only so many things they can say they could end up being found in you know, to be acting in, in you know, disrepute or bringing disrepute upon the force. Or, so, but I, I might look at it, maybe if I could get somebody and conceal their identity. Mm -hmm. But you under, I, I understand, like, why people, because especially if that gains a lot of attention, yep. if you can be identified, whether it's by means of jigsaw identification, where somebody can go, I heard points A, B and C, and that means I know that this is, you know, person X or whatever. It would yeah. be quite interesting, though, so if any police... Uh, would like to come on. I can guarantee you anonymity will change your voice or something. We can make you sound like Orville if you come <laughs> on. They'll never know it was you. <laughs> Superb. Other people you've interviewed, Sean, uh, like say Mary Black, MP, uh, Stuart Cosgrove, Jim White. What, like say, keep going back to it, but uh, Osama bin Laden's henchmen, if you like. Yeah. What's been your highlight? What's been the, the, the sort of bit you were like, do you know what? That was great. I loved that. Or have they all been like that? Has it just all been snowballed into one? Yeah, I would say that. 99% of them I've thoroughly, deeply enjoyed. Um, I would say my favourite, I'll think carefully about this one. My grandpa was a special one to be uh -huh. able to share that with him. That was great fun. Um, having Gordon Smart on, very good pal, I mean, yep. and a top, absolute top man. 
uh, and we've had a lot of fun uh, off the back of that as well, or off the back of knowing each other. He was great to be doing. I would say the favourite would be Martin Melly. I don't know if you've heard that episode. So Martin Melly, uh, member of the Twenty Minute Times, and he very openly spoke about his his experience with depression, and we kind of shared our experiences on that. And um, it wasn't a cynical attempt at playing cultural bingo. You know, like sometimes people like to just hit things that are they're in, they're, they're, they're in fashion or they're in vogue. Um, that was kind of when it just started, and we did it for the. He, it was all very much him, but he wanted to share that experience because he'd come out the other side of it and he had he had something to offer in terms of advice and a light at the end of the tunnel and showing, you know, here's how easily you can slip into something like this. Showing how, I know some of it was probably a chemical imbalance, but the majority was based on the, the sort of experiences that he was having. Circumstantial depression, if you will. like, yeah. uh, And talking about it, and we basically... It was unfiltered. It was unedited. It was it was raw. It was sort of rough around the edges, and we were ex- we spoke about everything about the whole social media illusion that you can sometimes have. Because he said on the thing, he said, "Oh, well, I was absolutely struggling, but I saw you sitting on a rooftop in Barcelona having cocktails, and I was jealous." And I said, "Mate, I was probably at my lowest ever point at that stage, and it was good to to, to sort of get into those." And I think for the fact that I really enjoyed that, he's one of my closest pals, I absolutely love him, so that was great to do that, but the impact that that then went on to have on people was unbelievable, I think it inspired a, you know, a couple of men's support groups and those kind of things, um, and again, it was very it was very authentic, I'm very cautious, and I'll just pick my words carefully here, sometimes very distrusting of when people will create things when you can see it maybe if they're not offering anything, if it's just a pity party, because I don't think that helps anybody. Yeah. If it's just someone's constantly repeating a story of a, a dark time, I think, right, okay, where's this going? Other than for you to get a wee bit of a dopamine hit when people listen to you or patting you in the back. But I think uh, f- for the impact that it had um, and continues to have, like we still get people for this d- to this day. And it was all, it was all Martin. It was all him. No, I just happened to be the, the conduit who, who could provide that sort of that platform. platform. Yeah, um, I was going to say that because in series one of the Salt and Sauce show, we had uh, Libby Emerson on the show. Um, who back on side, back is it? Back on side, yeah. I mean, she was superb. She spoke at length about her struggles with mental health mm. uh, and how she helps other football players in the industry as well. Libby was superb. And I think, like you say, if, if we can use this sort of platform to promote things like that, then yeah, absolutely. Um, something that you've struggled with recently and in the and in the press and on, in the... In the media at the moment, it's obviously the, the talking point of every newspaper and every s- news channel, if you like. It's COVID. Yeah. Uh, you were diagnosed with COVID-19, weren't you? Yes, a few weeks ago. Um, I came back for the... Ju- the irony is I've been all over Europe this summer, and then I think I caught it in the east end of Glasgow. So just, like, you can get it anywhere. Um, I'd obviously be very careful everywhere I go, you know, respecting rules, distancing, face masks or whatever. I have I felt like... I was going to catch it at some point. I feel like everybody will. It's kind of unavoidable. It's spreading through the world. But um, it was a good few weeks ago. And I, I think I came in for the gym. And I felt sore than I usually would. But I just put it down there. I was just for the gym. Next day, Tuesday, I didn't go. But I was feeling sore again. And then I, I didn't really think too much. But then the sneezing and the coughing started. And I was like, oh, shit. So I had to go. I went for the test. Yeah, um, what was the point where you thought, do you know what I really need to go and see about this now? What was the... Um, my auntie actually works for if you phone up the helpline. Right. So I told I, I just told her in passing. So she's phoned me straight away asking me questions. So I'd been feeling I think this this was in the Wednesday, so maybe about thirty six hours after I started feeling a wee bit funny. So I let, like literally no time. And uh, I thought, right, I better lie low just for a bit and see how this develops. Got worse. Um and she was asking what the symptoms I had, the sore throat and all that. She's like, go for a test and just know, because um, it would have been dangerous to say, I'll lie low for a few days. So I went for the test, but then I woke up on the Friday. I had the text saying you're positive. I didn't need it because the symptoms were... They were Did you lose your sense of taste as well? Like I've lost it now. Right. So it was really weird. So the, the process I went was muscles were sore. I started sneezing. So, uh, throat was a bit sore, but it was just like a mad fatigue. So I was like, all right, it kind of feels a bit flu-y symptoms. Um, 
Then it was sort of headaches, feeling just all your standard stuff, really. Yeah. Uh, the only difficult, I didn't have any difficulty with breathing or anything like that. That was all normal, but the throat was dead. So um, I very quickly started to bounce back because by the Monday, uh, so I get a test, I think, the Wednesday. By the Monday, I was feeling better. But I was, see, when I was brushing my teeth all week, this sounds sound weird, but I was brushing my teeth and I'm going, this toothpaste is off. Because it tastes weird, but I honestly, I just didn't connect the dots. Blaming the Colgate. And then I went to eat a bit of garlic bread. It's funny. And I've t- a bit in it, and I'm like, this is this must be off. Because there's no taste to this whatsoever. There's nothing. And then, obviously, I was like, oh, idiot. Obviously, your taste is gone. And it's, it is the weirdest and thing. Has that come back now since it's, it's passed? Or? Ever so slightly. Honestly, I've got about 5% of my taste. You can th- you can taste citrus. That's really weird. Right. So if I'd, I had an orange Lucasade Sport, I could taste it fine. Well, I could work out that it was orange Lucasade Sport. If I had to do a taste test blindfolded. But everything else, no, I can't really taste it. And it is the weirdest, weirdest thing. You just you, you can feel texture and temperature, but no taste. And honestly, I would have took the symptoms back if it meant I could just get my taste because it's ripped to the joy out of my life. Like, I can't <laughs> taste in it. I, hopefully it'll come back. No, I think they say like a few weeks and then you'll right. you'll be back to normal. I mean, obviously there's people like protesting saying, oh, it's a big myth, it's a big hoo-ha. What do you say to people like that? Um, I think, right, I had a taxi driver, an Uber driver yesterday who was just adamant that it was just made up and it was a plot to enslave humanity. And he was kind of citing a few things that governments have done, whether it's through financial remodelling or a chance to reset the economy, or obviously we're aware that in order for the economy to work at the behest of corporations, it has to be sort of to the right of centre, at least gradually over time. Economies will move further to the left. Governments have probably seized an opportunity to reshape things to their advantage. Right? They've used it, they've went, all right, this is quite annoying, it's pure destroying our economy, but we've got a chance to kind of make it advantageous for ourselves. But I was saying to him, I don't dispute that. This guy that was saying it was all just a, to, a plot to enslave humanity and we're all getting flogged in concentration camps. That, and honest to God, that's what he's saying. I'm like, where is the hidden camera in here? Because uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a wind-up. Like, Jeremy Beadle's going to jump out any minute. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, you're telling me that of the 196 nations plus the European Union, the United Nations and any other body, these countries that hate each other and are at war and that are constantly battling for power, you're telling me that in the space of a few months, somebody convinced them all oh, to just wreck their economies and work together for some unknown means, which you say is to enslave humanity and to introduce a universal wage, but that means you have to relinquish all ownership of things that you've got. Like, mate, you can't really genuinely believe that. And that, that's how ridiculous, ridiculous it is. I can't convince five of my pals to agree on the same bar, like if we were going on a night no. out, and you're telling me that somebody's managed to convince <laughs> Iran and the USA and China and North Korea and Russia and the UK and Germany to all be in cahoots with each other. Even you had Boris Johnson saying for ages, that was a lot of piss, it doesn't exist. And then he reluctantly accepted that it was real. So w- what is the end goal? Like, who is this person? Make him, like, make him leader of, the, of a one world, uh, sorry, a one state planet then if he's able to convince all these people to work together it's, it's absurd it's insane I, I was ill I, I was done in I'm still done in I've still got like a tickly cough and I can't taste it and mm. I'm not saying it's some you know 28 days later style bug that's going to end the planet but it obviously exists and right now there isn't really much known about it because like we were saying off here you know you get information but then that changes because they do more research or you know, it's a, it's a developing situation. It's annoying. It's frustrating. I hate it. I'm against, like, lockdowns and stuff. So there's another thing. People, it, it's become like, a, or people are trying to turn it into a binary issue. Yeah. You're for it or you're against it. You believe in it or you don't. Uh, you want lockdown or you don't. Well, I believe in it. I test you positive. I was done in. I still don't really want extended lockdowns. I feel like we should be trying to get, you know, the world moving a wee bit while obviously being... Uh, and concerned about people's health. So where does that put me? You know what I mean? It's just it, there isn't just two sides to the to the the argument. So I, I just think it's absurd. Like of all the conspiracy theories, like at least pick one that's more interesting. Like I don't know the moon or the Titanic or something. <laughs> UFOs. Uh, so obviously with that, you've been a bit of action for the last few weeks. Yeah. Have you got any podcasts lined up to be done? I I have got a guy on Friday, Paul Pettigrew, his name is, and he's been in the media recently because he was suicidal as a result of racking up severe gambling. Right. 
um, debts and his gambling addiction was crippling him. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to talking to him because he's set his group's called Gam Talk, um, which people should check out because I think that um, gambling addiction and people suffering silently with it or battling it silently because it's not really anything that has any physical symptoms other yeah. than people exhibiting stress or, or, or distress or whatever. Uh, I think that's like probably linked to a lot of suicides. So I'm looking forward to speaking to him because I think he played for Morton. Right. Um, and there's probably a whole conversation to be had there about why was he gambling? Why was he trying to win money? How does how do you get into it? So that'll be good. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I should say about see the one I was telling you. I'll, I'm going to save that one just in case it doesn't happen. There's um, no, no in case it doesn't happen because it is happening. We've agreed, but the date isn't finalised. Uh, there is a very prominent ex English Premier League footballer has said he would come on. I've got his number on my phone, which is a buzz. Um, <laughs> But he's a very, very, very busy guy, so it's just a case of when he's ready. Uh, so you still waiting on him to confirm? Aye, aye. He, he said he'll do it, but he, he's got loads happening. And oh, I know, I'll I know tell you who it is. Mate. I know that I, feeling. I'll tell you who it is off there, um, because he's been brand new, but I need to just kind of wait. Aye, and uh, a few others. Um, some You're a busy guy. Aye. Busy guy. I, suppose, I, I, I don't like, I know that's it's a terrible answer, isn't it, when you ask, who have you got on? I go, aye, Hunters, and then don't say it else. <laughs> but I like to just be like, right, just drop it when it comes. But the, the Paul Pettigrew one, oh, I'm looking forward to that, because um, hopefully a lot of good comes for it as well. Definitely. Well, I've loved having you on the show as my guest. How's it been, being the other side of the mic? <sighs> Sorry. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Brilliant. No, I've, I've loved it. It's been, it's been great fun. I like being asked questions. I like just talking, like I said to Paul uh, on text, I like just... Talking pish, basically. So thanks for allowing me to do that. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean McDonald. Cheers, mate.